one of our Cleveland Clinic Florida colorectal alumni, Dr. Andre Dore, professor of surgery at University Hospitals in Louvain, Belgium, and the innovator of the laparoscopic ventral rectopexy is going to speak to us about minimally invasive treatment of rectal prolapse. Andre, we're ready for you. Good morning, uh, Steve. I, uh, I hope you, you can hear me clear. And um, it's an honor to uh, participate in this uh, center, um, in this program. So um, here it comes. It's, um, I'm going to address laparoscopic ventral mesh rectopexy for rectal prolapse syndromes and open a little bit of the discussion so far. Next, next slide, please. So um, it's important that we do have some understanding about the disease and um, Rather than in the former times where we clearly focused only on uh, overt rectal prolapse, today we consider it as a, a kind of a, a spectrum. And you have those patients with internal prolapses, with obvious some uh, clinical uh, problems as uh, obstructification and uh, fecal incontinence, and we're going to address that. And those combined prolapses, as you can see, um, with a rectal seal and intersusception or a huge uh, endroseal that also protrudes through the anal rectal ring. Next, Next slide. So when we look to the age distribution, and this gives us a little bit of the flare of the disease, majority of female patients, 90%, 10% are, are male patients, but you have like an early peak at the 20s here, and those are the patients who have clearly probably a congenital weakness of support of the rectum, or those are the pe people really have a problem with uh, a straining, a, a, a chronic straining disorder, and as an end result, they, they breach it open and they develop um, prolapses. When you go on the H axis and at the other spectrum, you will dose the elderly people with a complete weakened denervated pelvic floor, floor, and those are the prolapses where you see combinations with the prolapses of the uh, middle and anterior pelvic compartment. So you clearly can see here in this uh, young lady with prolapse, you, you see the, the deep Douglas fault, but you don't see, you see that there is a normal support of the middle pelvic sub, uh, uh, compartment. Next slide. Next slide, and so here you can see the combined prolapse with a prolapse of the uh, sigmoid colon coming through, and on the right side of the image you see combined uh, total rectal prolapse with a uh, uterine prolapse. Next slide. So one of the consequences of uh, prolapses, not only of the external and progressively there seems some, some belief also from internal prolapses, is that you get a progressive mechanical stretching of the uh, pelvic floor muscles and of the internal and external anal sphincter. And this will uh, lead to uh, the, the finding of uh, fecal incontinence. And, and as you can see there on the clinical picture of those patients, they have like a patellus anus, and indeed all those muscles are stretched by the uh, prolapse. And so for external rectal prolapse, if we, we let it untreated, all those patients will become fecal incontinent. Next slide. Next slide. So when we uh, look to the surgical treatment, of course, we want to restore anatomy. But on top of that, you should look to the end result, and that's also looking to anorectal function, avoidance of functional sequelae, and avoidance of operative morbidity. And avoidance of operative morbidity, there is where it fits with the minimal invasive approaches. Next slide. So we do have the perineal and the abdominal techniques. The perineal, we have the delorms, which is a kind of mucosectomy, and the perineal rectosigmoid resection, also referred to as the Altmaier technique. And then you have the abdominal approaches, today most often performed laparoscopically, and either you do rectopexy with or without a resection of the sigmoid colon. Next slide. 
Next slide. So here you can see this is um, we on the uh, uh, in Europe favored the delorms, a classical delorms is a mucosectomy and use uh, not a complete transmural inc incision, but you just strip off the uh, mucosa and then you will plicate the muscular wall and then imbricate again the uh, uh, mucosa and so you make a mucosa mucosal uh, anastomosis next slide and um, this is an opposite to the Altmeier uh, procedure where you clearly do a transmural incision and from the perineal aspect or transanal aspect you resect the uh, prolapsed rectum and part of the sigmoid column. The thing is, and, and this is sure, that in, in regard to recurrences, it's better than the lorms because you can uh, resect more than in the lorms. So we, we now preserve the lorms for very small distal prolapses. But the problem is uh, fecal in incontinence because of at the end you bring like a, a the, the, the sigmoid colon to the uh, um, dilated uh, uh, sphincter muscles so in most of the cases you will try to add the levator plasty to improve continence next slide so it's important that we look to the uh, uh, differences and this is um, uh, an important uh, um, like clinical snapshot how we treat rectal prolapses and uh, Dr. Wexner was a co-author in this uh, uh, work done and so we looked at the preferred treatment options in the United States and compared that to um, continental Europe and the UK and certainly in when you look there is um, still in favor the resection rectopexy and in Europe, we do the ventral mesh rectopexy. And next slide, please. But when you will look to the external prolapse in frail and elderly people, there we all agree that there is still a place for the perineal techniques. About 82% of all surgeons perform a, per a kind of perineal technique in the old and frail people. But again, when you look to the, the younger generations with external prolapses, the classical prolapses in a fit patient, then you see the differences between Europe and North America. And on top of that, when we look to internal prolapse, this is only occasionally operated on in North America, but there is increasing interest to position the lap ventral rectopexy also for internal prolapses in uh, Europe. Next slide. So, and although we, we are able to control the, the anatomic defect, again, what's the problem with um, rectal prolapse is often the poor functional result. And this becomes more apparent, I guess, and, and fuels the, 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 the whole discussion when we shift then to uh, internal prolapses. Next slide. When we look to the uh, problem of constipation after rectopexy, and I guess this is very important, and of course you can induce a stenosis and a mechanical obstruction due to the mes mesh position, of course, some will argue you should take out a redundant sigmoid colon, but most of patients with a prolapse do have a redundant sigmoid. It's all belief, and this is um, backed by um, some data, it's that by doing a classical rectopexy technique, you induce autonomic denervation because in classical mesh rectopexy, you intensively, you completely mobilize the, the rectum and you will hook it up at a higher level. And uh, next slide. In this uh, elegant study performed in the Netherlands uh, by Mullen, you can see this is the effect of doing rectal mobilization on colonic function. And you can see when you, you mobilize the rectum, you increase the colon 
transit time and this is due to the the segment tree so in in segment tree you induce in an inertia and this is increased by factor 2.5 next slide and as such this uh, provides and gives you some post hoc rationale why the frequent Goldberg works because you you extensively mobilize the rectum, you hook it up with a suture max, uh, pexy here, and then you resect the sigmoid colon, and it looks like that. So rather, because the, the Friedman Goldberg was, was, was invented or was started to reduce the number uh, of recurrences, here on top you have the, the post hoc rationale why it functionally works. Next slide. It's also important that we look to um, defecating proctograms, either on the classical way or, or on the dynamic MRIs. And here you can see that the, there is always or nearly always an, an important descent also from the middle compartment with the small bowel coming. And then at the end of the straining in a, in a patient with total rectal prolapse, you see that even small bowel protrudes through the inner ring. And of course, you should deal with that to optimize the results. Next slide. So here you see the background then for laparoscopic ventral mesh rectopexy, perineal procedures, important recurrence rates, and fecal incontinence. And we, we, we stress on that that it's due to the re reduction of the rectal reservoir. Classical mesh rectopexy or rectopexy procedures, you see most postoperative constipation. And we do know from defecographic studies that we should uh, look to the intensusception anteriorly and the impact on the middle pelvic compartment. Next slide. This brings us then to the um, uh, development of the uh, new surgical technique, the concept. So correct the leading cause, correct concomitant enterocel, and preserve rectal ampulla, avoid uh, autonomic nerve damage, and make it laparoscopically safe. Next slide. Here you can see the um, a cartoon of the um, um, mesh recto, the ventral mesh rectopexy, and we just dissect within the rectal vaginal septum. Here you see the suturing to the anterior aspect of the rectum. It inhibits the intussusception. You hook it up to the uh, sacral promontory. It provides you a tool also to correct level one of the middle compartment uh, uh, descent. And it also um, restores the rectovaginal septum. So you see the um, small bowel is uh, lifted out of the pelvis and you see a huge um, uh, deepened uh, prolapse there. The sacro-uterine ligaments in this case are still present. So you only will do rectopexy. You see the, the landmarks, the ureter. Um, once you, we, we just open up the peritoneum along the sacral promontory, you can uh, see the uh, left uh, uh, iliac vein which sometimes is very close and then we just incise the uh, peritoneum and then you firmly redress the um, the, the uh, cul-de-sac so to reduce the uh, prolapse and um, once you are opening that then you progressively you in, in complete contrast with a uh, rectal cancer case you just will dissect upon the uh, bare uh, muscular coat of the uh, rectum. So, and this, uh, you just make like a tunnel uh, behind the uh, vagina, which you can appreciate here. So the, the assistant surgeon lifts the vagina, and then you see the uh, tunnel created. Then uh, we use a uh, polypropylene strip of mesh, um, a non-resorbable, you position it and um, you can tailor the mesh to your needs. If you need a broader uh, protection, then you can uh, uh, cut it out. We routinely do like extracorporeal anastomosis to speed up the uh, um, operation. 
That is the side of the intersusception. There you clearly should um, uh, suture the uh, anterior aspect of the rectum to the mesh to inhibit any further intersusception. Here you see the, the finalized aspects of the suturing. Today we more and more uh, use some glue, not at this side, but more deeper in the uh, rectovaginal septum to speed up the operation. Here you see now, without undue traction, you then um, fix the, uh, the mesh to the sacred promontory and you avoid the incorporation, of course, of the um, hypogastric nerve. So once that in place, we do an additional suture because we have seen some recurrences there at that level. So now to inhibit further higher up into susception, so one additional uh, suture, and then you firmly close the peritoneal uh, uh, flaps on top of this uh, mesh, and this is the end result. Okay, so maybe before we go on to some yeah. of the results, Perfect. a be beautiful video, and we'll talk about the technique, but I, I just want to back up a moment, if we might, and maybe turn to one of the other centers. Tell us, what is your pre-op evaluation in, in two scenarios? Firstly, you have a patient who comes in with full thickness rectal prolapse. What is your evaluation of that patient prior to surgery? So um, I, I think that, um, you know, these um, patients, older eight patients, we make sure they had their a recent screening colonoscopy. Um, we evaluate the pelvic floor oftentimes with a pelvic MRI a dynamic test to see if there's concomitant uh, anterior prolapse. Um, and then uh, we go on to discuss both medical um, assessment of appropriate abdominal versus perineal um, approaches. <clears throat> so any, any physiology studies thrown in there? Is there any reason to do anything? E manometry, EMG, defogram, is there any point in any of that? MRI, we can, or you can ask Ben next to you because he may know the answer. Um, Dynamic MRI pretty much will tell us, uh, you know, the, the physiology to see if there's any internal intersusception or, or any other um, concomitant uh, pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, obviously, seeing if there's any underlying fecal incontinence with the patient is part of the history. Constipation is part of the history. Straining is part of the history. And also just the age of the patient as well um, to see what type of repair you might want to consider. Um, all kind of goes into the into the picture. Um, obviously, like you said, a recent colonoscopy, and to rule out any other etiologies for the prolapse mechanical. Now, now take the scenario of the patient who has intersusception. Let's say you know you uh, the patient gives symptoms of incomplete evacuation, um, some difficult evacuation. Maybe during your office endoscopy, you noted some intersusception. Do you do anything differently in that patient? Um, and, and they have yes. full thickness rectal prolapse as well? No, 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 no not full thickness. Just rectal intersusception, either by suspicion or by endoscopy. Do you, do you do a different evaluation or is it the same in that patient? Yeah, I think I would confirm with MRI defecography or just uh, so anal, anal rectal physiology. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, and I think that's the time where anal rectal manometry will give you some sense of, you know, paradoxical contraction, the pubic rectalis, give you some other senses of perhaps, con you know, concomitant pelvic floor dysmotility with associated role of uh, pelvic floor physical therapy to help improve, you know, the anticipated functional outcome. You know, before rushing to a, in, a prolapse repair for interrective prolapse, um, I would probably stress more of a, of a physiological or physical therapy approach to try to retrain muscles and get better function. And if it comes to internal rectal prolapse repair, then at least you're, you're maximizing your chance of success from a functional perspective. Okay, th thanks very much. Uh, let, let's go back to Louvain, Belgium uh, and ask uh, uh, Professor Dor, um, what is your evaluation in those two settings? Just to tell us before you've decided on laparoscopic ventral rectopexy, either for prolapse or, or for interception, what, what's your preferred evaluation? Okay, so for external rectal prolapse, um, we, we ask them to have a full colonoscopy and um, of course we're gonna look to um, difficult grams also to rule out um, what's happening in the middle and the anterior compartment to really have a, uh, like a, a complete 
picture uh, before we we embark on on uh, uh, restoration of the uh, prolapse. Of course, it's completely different with the patient coming in with obstructive defecation syndrome. In those, we we do on top of uh, functional defecograms, we do a balloon evacuation test and. Um, also, so evacuation um, manometry. So we look whether they, they got this synergia or not. And then when we see this synergia, we're going to try to fix that first with um, biofeedback training. And it's always difficult to, to, to find out whether it's the, um, the, the internal prolapse itself, which you can uh, clearly uh, visualize on the uh, defecography, or the functional deficit that causes a majority of the problems. So once we had them gone through biofeedback and we see some improvement on balloon evacuation tests or manometries when they devoid the rectum um, so that they get like more appropriate uh, expulsion test, then probably um, uh, going to give in a subgroup of those patients also ventral mesh rectopexy. Okay, th thanks. That's a very good explanation. I appreciate it. I want to turn for a moment, if we could, to Imperial College in London and see if, if either Ara Darzi or, or Paris Tekis. Nope. So who's the victim no. here? Uh, you guys have a big robotic experience. Um, tell us what you do for um, a rectal prolapse case. Is it the European standard laparoscopic ventral rectopexy? Or is it uh, robotic? Is it some other form of surgery, preferred treatment uh, for prolapse, let's say in a fit 45-year-old woman. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm James Kinross. I'm one of the attendings here at Imperial. Um, we, we don't routinely deploy robotic surgery for this. Um, there are some centers in the UK who will do it as standard, but these are uh, in the minority. Uh, a laparoscopic approach would absolutely be the standard uh, approach, particularly in the patient of the demographic you've uh, described. Right. And how about, uh, as Andre showed in his sort of algorithm, uh, the elderly patient, so um, elderly unfit patient. He mentioned that um, there are two options, the DeLorme, which at one point was the most popular uh, in the survey from the Association of Coloproctology of Great Britain and Ireland, and then the perineal rectosigmoidectomy, which, which Andre mentioned, has certain advantages. What's your preferred approach these days? Um, well, I think in our institution, we still, uh, we still use the DeLorms uh, as our uh, go-to operation, really, in elderly people uh, with a high comorbidity and high risk. Um, do you want to comment, Alex, on that at all? I, I think, hi, I'm Alex Monroe, and I'm a consultant surgeon and director here at uh, Imperial. Um, I, I think as the, the PROSPER trial showed, uh, the, the UK um, experience and practice really is still largely based on, on perineal procedures, particularly in older patients. So that's still, they still hold sway in, in an older patient. Okay, that, thanks a lot. Let's go back to Louvain, Belgium, and, and uh, Professor Dor can continue with the presentation, please, and then we'll okay. pause again and ask some more questions shortly. Thank you. So here you see uh, our indications. It's external rectal prolapse, which is evident, and then the high-grade internal rectal prolapses, especially those with fecal incontinence, more controversial with uh, obstructive defecation, and then those uh, cases with a rectal seal with a high-grade intersusception and entrosis with high-grade intersusception. Next slide. So. Here you see our case series, about 500 uh, uh, patients, large majority with female, mean age 50 years. Again, you see some, some very young people and uh, very old patients there. 40% uh, were external rectal prolapses. And then you see the, the whole descent here, rect rectal seals and intro seals and internal rectal prolapse, 25%. And then 40% for internal rectal prolapse, with obstructive defecation or with incontinence. And we added the perineotomy in 100 of those cases, um, but we 
we, we are coming back from from that approach because um, we had seen uh, we have seen an increase of um, mesh erosions to the distal part of the vagina, especially in that subgroup of, of uh, technical adjunct. Next slide. So uh, when we, in regard to the safety profile, it's quite, quite easy to perform. We had very few conversions, but I mentioned the left iliac vein is very close. We, in one patient, we had to convert because we had a severe bleeding at the site of the le left iliac vein. We hadn't any mortality. Progressively, uh, median hospital stay is going down, and now we do it on uh, one night stay, and even some uh, cases in uh, um, in daycare uh, procedures. In hospital, mor morbidity is very limited. Next slide. So it's important that we look to the um, long-term outcome. I will address recurrences, functional outcome. Uh, fecal incontinence, constipation, and mesh-related septic complications. Next slide. And indeed, we do have seen uh, some recurrences. And the longer uh, you wait and you observe, you see a, a slight increase there. So we looked to the group of patients with external rectal, uh, external rectal prolapse, and this is a combined effort with a uh, hospital from the Netherlands. We piled up 242 patients, and at 10 years interval, we do have a recurrence rate of 8.2%. Next slide, and here you see, can, uh, see the uh, kaplan uh, uh, Meyer estimates of uh, recurrences and this matches uh, the results from uh, more classical mesh rectopexy. So although we limited the, the amount of this section, you can see that the um, recurrence free survival is uh, equal. Next slide. And um, this is important that we also look whether if we restore the static pelvic anatomy, whether we see a functional improvement on incontinence and constipation. Next slide. As I mentioned already, um, due to the, um, uh, the prolapse itself, you get the mechanical stretching of the sphincter complex. There are also other mechanisms that uh, will lead to uh, uh, fecal incontinence, like pudendal neuropathy, impaired rectal adaptation to distension, and impaired rectoanal motility. And uh, next slide, when we looked to our pilot series of patients, um, you clearly can uh, see that the, the, the median Wexner score was 13, with uh, some, uh, some patients clearly complete incontinent when they showed up for uh, rectal prolapse repair. And you can uh, um, see that postoperatively, you significantly uh, increase the, the likelihood of continence although some, as you can see here, three patients remained uh, completely incontinent. But we found an improvement, a significant improvement, in 90% of our patients. Next slide. Again, when we go to the cohort analysis, and here we look to 920 patients, and this is now published in the Annals of Surgery, you see that the grade 4 incontinence was present preoperatively in 37% of patients, and this drops to 11%, which is significantly. Next slide. It's good to knowledge, acknowledge that once you get the improvement early on, you see this remains stable over time. So once you add five year follow up or a 10 years post operative follow up, we see the same figures. So in some way you can prevent further deterioration of uh, continence in patients with uh, prolapse. Next slide. And this is very important then when you look to a group of patients who were operated on not with overt rectal prolapse but with intraanal rectal intersusception, so the deep uh, endoanal prolapses and incontinence, you see the, the, just the same improvement in that subgroup of patients. Next slide. And this brings us then, and this is certainly open for discussion, to a kind of algorithm that in those patients with a high-grade intersusception and incontinence, 
probably you first should fix the intersusception and wait for the recovery and only in those patients who have a persistent incontinence then embark to sacral nerve stimulation. But of course there should be in the future a head-to-head -head comparison where you can randomize patients with high-grade intersusception to lab ventral mesh rectopexy and sacral nerve uh, stimulation. Of course, next slide, we do know that there are some predictors of um, uh, persistence of uh, incontinence. This is the patient average age. Of course, the, the, elder, the, the older the patients, the more uh, risk you have that they remain incontinent, symptom duration, and also those patients who have preoperative urinary incontinence. Well, let's just interject here two, two things. Firstly, you, you showed a little algorithm there that included uh, also nerve stimulation as, as an option in this group, and I'm curious just to get another view uh, on the basic treatment algorithm again uh, and, and how the incontinence is treated, whether first addressing the incontinence or first addressing the intersusception, uh, if that's the case. Let, let's go to IRCAD in, in Strasbourg, France, and see perhaps either Jacques or Joël is there. Uh, somebody might take a stab at this. Your your preferred algorithm is it what uh, Andre discussed or, or another one? Question. Hello, I am uh, Didier Mutter from Strasbourg. Uh, Joël Leroy is not here. He's uh, traveling somewhere in the world. <laughs> so we do. Uh, we can have a, an answer from one of, of our colorectal fellow here in Strasbourg. Uh, good, uh, good morning uh, or good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Um, we have not so many experience with uh, sacral nerve stimulation, but um, this uh, might be a very promising uh, treatment for patients that uh, have a persistence incontinence. Uh, may be caused by pudendal nerve uh, neuropathy. So, indeed, we think this is a very interesting future treatment, and um, we might embark on these kinds of treatments as well in the future. Thank you. Th thank you very much, and I, I wish Joel safe travels. Um, can we go to Anne Arundel Medical Center, please? We have a question from Anne Arundel um, that they'd like to pose. Morning, Adrian. Hey, good morning, Steve. Actually, a question. Um, I'm very much appreciating the the, uh, the presentation, but uh, uh, from a, my own naive perspective, I don't I don't do this surgery. But but as one who does a lot of hernia and foregut surgery, um, it, it's it's uh, I'm I'm, in, I'm intrigued by the placement of this mesh, and uh, the professor said there's been one vaginal erosion. I mean it. It, it's uh, in, in the hernia and foregut world. I mean, it's anathema to us to, to put uh, polypropylene or polyester any, anywhere close to viscera or around the esophagus or anything. How, how, how long? You know, how? What's your explanation, I guess, for the the small number of erosions when you're putting it straight on rectum and vagina? It, it's it's remarkable to me. The esophagus won't tolerate that for a for a minute. Um, and again, on abdominal wall uh, reconstructions, we'd never consider exposing polypropylene that way. I'm just intrigued, and, I, and I'm, I'm intrigued that it's not, this doesn't become a complication. Um, th thanks a lot, Adrian. So let's turn back to uh, Louvain, Belgium, and, and Andre, why don't you take that question? Yeah, please. I can address that. I, I, I guess, um, of course, you don't uh, put uh, mesh on the column, but you rather push put a mesh in front of the muscular coat of the rectum and there the, the rectal coat is uh, quite a different uh, texture than a uh, colon. Also you try to avoid to have any kinking of the mesh so that it remains flat and when we do the dissection we leave all remainder fatty tissue so we go behind the novilis fascia so the novilis fascia or the remainders of that remain to the vaginal side so you still have like a layer then between the mesh and the dorsal vagina okay so when we looked and do constipation and this was our uh, cohort our first uh, study a pilot study 
we we had we we quoted patients as having um, uh, constipation in 56 percent and we used uh, validated questionnaires for that and that postoperatively dropped to 26 percent next slide and here you clearly can see that we, we corrected obstructed defecation um, and that was a, a quite a, an interesting finding that probably due to the position of the mesh into the rectal vagina septum you reinforce the rectal vagina septum and that could help the rectal evacuation and we saw very few new onset obstructed defecations next slide this then has been uh, uh, seen also in other uh, series. Next slide, please. And you can see that about 70% of patients uh, do see a clear improvement of obstructive defecation and that new onset or worsening of, of obstructive defecation is seldom. Next slide. But of course, uh, constipation is uh, quite complex and you can have defecation disorders. On top of that, some overlap with slow transit constipation, the IBS group of patients, and of course you, ha you, you should rule out organic or secondary constipations. So this makes it um, very important that you make an appropriate uh, patient selection. Next slide. And this, of course, uh, started the, the whole discussion and it was raised by the Oxford group that said, okay, now we have a tool also to operate on patients with internal rectal prolapse. But of course, Sir Lorberg was very critical on that in colorectal disease in 2014, that uh, it's really time for a critical appraisal and we shouldn't overrate, I guess, the role of uh, operating on patients of internal prolapse and obstructive defecation. Next slide. It was again the uh, uh, group of uh, Oxford who looked into detail in quite a number of patients, 74, with internal rectal prolapse. Next slide. And also another group uh, from the UK. And you clearly can see that they saw a, uh, uh, an important improvement in constipation scores, not only in patients with total rectal prolapse, but also in patients with rectal seals and intussusception and obstructive defecation syndrome. Next slide. And the group from Nantes uh, looked to their uh, patients operated on for complex rectal seals, and you clearly can see that you, you have like, a, uh, the, the more you have constipation before the operation, the more the likelihood of having any uh, benefit out of that. Next slide. When we looked and do our cohort uh, data again, in the pre-op setting, 54% of our patients were constipated and that dropped to 16%. And you can see that new onset, uh, onset uh, uh, constipations is very seldom. Next slide. This brings us um, to like uh, an overall figure that about 70% of patients do have an improvement. But of course, you can also look to that in a reverse way and say, Okay, it only works in 70%, so in 30% of patients, it doesn't do anything. So I'd leave it again open for discussion. I think that's that's excellent uh, point to take home. Uh, maybe we can turn to one of the other centers we haven't asked, and, and Sharet Zedek in, in, in Israel, uh, and ask, uh, is this the preferred approach? Is the... Um, Good afternoon, gentlemen. Patakia, uh, where, where does the laparoscopic ventral rectopexy fall for your, your treatment of prolapse? Is it the preferred treatment uh, for younger patients? Is it, and if so, is it also the preferred treatment in the older group, or do you still use perineal approaches? Well, we, uh, we use perineal approaches uh, seldom for uh, older people uh, with a low functional capacity. And for younger, fit people, we always use the resection rectopexy. 
um, like old school. Um, but I was very impressed with the results of uh, Professor Dewar. Uh, although I have a couple of questions, uh, uh, if he can explain to us uh, the uh, uh, physiology of improving constipation after such a procedure. Because looking at this technique, it looks like uh, that this mesh is actually making the sigmoid rectal angle more acute. And I would expect that that may cause a problem in terms of uh, colon motility. Uh, so I would be curious to know what, what is the explanation of improving constipation in, uh, with, uh, with this technique. Uh, the other question that I have is whether diverticulosis, which is a very common uh, finding in such uh, patients, uh, does that, uh, is this a contraindication for the procedure? Uh, is it worrisome that uh, diverticula are in very close uh, uh, vicinity to foreign material? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Okay. Okay. Excellent question. Um, thank you. So uh, we looked um, to the mechanism in, in which or how this uh, procedure would work for obstructification. And, uh, um, one way is the positioning of the mesh because you reinforce the rectovaginal septum. And a lot of those patients also have like a tendency to have a, a rectal seal. And some of the patients with prolapse also uh, digitate and, and uh, reinforce digitally uh, the vagina to evacuate the rectum. So by the unique position of the mesh, you reinforce so you make the, the anterior aspect of the, the um, uh, rectum more rigid. Also, by reducing the intersusception, it helps the, the patients to avoid the rectum. And we did colonic transit time, but I hadn't the time to, to look, um, to, to show it uh, today. But we, we, we clearly could, could see a significant decrease in colonic transit time, especially in the uh, third segment. So indeed, we could prove that we, we saw an in increased or a more rapid evacuation of the rectum. We haven't seen any impact on rectal capacity by the positioning of the mesh. So in the second part of your question is very interesting because indeed when we do have a patients with uh, um, a really diverticular colon on top of prolapse, in those patients we favor to do a resection rectopexy. So indeed there is a, a clear issue there that we don't, especially when the patient has a history of like a diverticular disease, then we would favor a, a, a resection rectopexy. Thanks, Andre. Why don't we leave it with you to just wrap up because uh, we're at the end of our time and we'll leave okay. you for the last couple of words. Okay, then uh, we, we go further with slides. Next slide, please. Next slide. And I guess um, it has, next slide, it has been uh, addressed so far and the question is of course whether you, you can um, um, use this for, um, uh, the whole problem of uh, the vaginal mesh is uh, coming into play here, but there is complete difference in the figures when we look to septic complications, when you uh, do the applications through the scope, or whether do you do a transfer channel approach. Next slide. Here you clearly can see when you look to all figures that mesh erosions are very seldom, 1.3%, the majority were when we did it with a combined perineotomy. And if you avoid that, you still can go lower than that. And chronic, chronic mesh infections and fistula are extremely seldom. Next slide. This brings it's completely different from transfer channel prolapse repairs where you see erosions in about 11% already within 12 months. Next slide. And when you look to sacral colpopexy, there it drops already to 4.7% and in our series we are below 2%. Next slide. When it did occur, as you can see here in the distal uh, vagina, uh, we pre-prepare the, the vagina with uh, oestrogel and then we make an incision and core it out and close the vagina on top. Next slide. 
There certainly is some discussion going on whether we need a permanent scaffold, and I do believe we do need. And of course, the biological measures are not all the same. Here you see um, the permacol not behaving like a, uh, uh, a classical biological mesh. Next slide. Next slide, please. And here you can see that there is an increase of recurrences already in the limited uh, literature when you look to biological the next slides. And this was clearly the findings in, in our urogynecology uh, um, uh, practice, as you can see here, the synthetic and biological, a significant difference in recurrence rates. So this will be, of course, the trade-off of the whole discussion uh, what is the, the the number of recurrences you do accept? Next slide, an ultimate slide for this uh, meeting. So here you can see surgery for rectal prolapse. We should restore the anatomy. We should look to incontinence and obstructification. When we look to recurrence rates, there the abdominal procedures are better than the perineal. When we look to the functional outcome, there the abdominal uh, procedures are, are the winners, but we, the caveat is, of course, new onset constipation. And then when we look to invasiveness, there the abdominal procedures are, are more invasive than the perineal procedures. Therefore, next slide, we should favor the uh, laparoscopic approach to reduce invasiveness. We should do rectopexy to reduce the number of recurrences. And, of course, we should position the mesh in our mindset at the ventral aspect to favor the functional outcome. I thank you for being with me this morning. Well, th thanks, Andre, for a phenomenal presentation. Uh, really well done. Very compelling, convincing data. Um, and uh, represents certainly uh, 17 years now of, of working on this procedure and, and bringing it through the world.